Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you uh, to you and to, to Ed for uh, hosting this lecture today. And, uh, you just informed me that, that this house used to be the home of uh, Gladstone. I think he lived in number 10, and then there's number 11. No, he lived here. He lived here at number 11. Okay. Well, I'm familiar with number 10 and number 11. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm aware also that there is a, another interesting gathering happening at 2 o'clock today, but in this gathering, um, I want to make the case today for progressive politics, rejecting a populism of the left as the answer to the populism of the right and instead embracing a unifying economic and social message driven from the center. But at this moment, it would be bizarre not to start with the issue which has divided our nation so much, Brexit. And I begin actually by praising the Prime Minister. She has striven hard from good intention with a poor hand a party divided, disputatious, and dogmatic in equal degrees, which then gave her an impossible circle to square. A frictionless border in Ireland, exit of the UK from the European Single Market and Customs Union, and yet Northern Ireland in the same relationship to Europe as the rest of the UK. This literally and technically cannot be done. So I sympathize with her. But nothing can disguise the nature of the deal she has chosen, if reports of it are true. <coughs> this deal isn't a compromise. It's a capitulation. The withdrawal agreement will keep us tied to EU trade policy until there is an end established by joint consent. In other words, the EU has a veto. Now, it's coated the deal in heavy fudge, but that is the inedible biscuit beneath the coating. As for future arrangements, that is essentially the Czech's proposal, which leaves us accepting existing EU rules and agreeing to abide by future ones. This is Brexit in theory, but still tied to Europe in reality, thus making a mockery of the reason for leaving. And whatever people voted for, it surely wasn't this. How did we arrive here? Because Theresa May wanted to unify the country after Brexit had so bitterly divided it. And this is the right ambition, and even a noble one. But the route she chose, stay in step with Europe's rules whilst leaving the political structures of decision making, is a dead end. It hasn't united the two sides of the Brexit debate, except in opposition to the deal. Remainers like me, leaders like Boris Johnson, are now in unholy alliance. We agree this is a pointless Brexit in name only, which is not the best of a bad job, but the worst of both worlds. In the cause, indeed, of taking back control, we'd lose the control we had. And it won't end the argument. It will perpetuate disunity, dragging us past March 2019 into a blind alley strewn with further and further rounds of negotiation, when we will have lost whatever leverage we had, and with the battle still being waged by those who want to stay close to Europe in the hope of one day rejoining, and those who want to break from Europe and forge a new future. So, this is the time for Remainers and Leavers to come together and understand there is only one way of ending the argument and reuniting the country. The only route to unity is clarity. And the only route to clarity is through the people. <coughs> Parliament must ask the British people to resolve the matter, to reconsider, to clarify their mandate, to do so in a vote which is accepted by all sides as conclusive, to give each side a chance to remake their case on the basis not of claim and counterclaim, but of the experience of the past 30 months. 
and to give Europe a chance to reconsider their offer to the British people after 30 months, which has also seen the politics of Europe change dramatically, particularly on the issue of immigration. So I know it is said that a new vote of the people will also divide, but a reconsideration in the light of all we now know, except the file as the final word, especially if accompanied by a new willingness on the part of Europe's leadership and Britain's to deal with the reasons for the Brexit decision, this is the only hope of unity in the future. And it is frankly gut-wrenching for me that this call is not being led by Labour as it should be. However, Brexit is but one example of how populism is all the rage. Forgive me for wearing my specs in this next bit, but all right, I can see you all now. Yeah. Very nice you are too. Um, not only in Europe, as with Poland or Hungary, and in the surge of outsider populist parties from Italy to Germany, or just look at Brazil or the Philippines, or indeed the United States. Populism is everywhere. By contrast, according to the prevailing political wisdom, the politics of the progressive center has gone out of fashion. But it never was a fashion. It was a philosophy. And it remains as relevant as it was and as it always will be. Of course, the philosophy must be applied today differently for radically different times. But when people say it has been rejected, the truth is, at least here in the UK, it's not recently been on offer. Furthermore, it has been systematically assaulted, not only from the right, but from the left. The denigration of the Labour Party record in government and its designation by the far left as neoliberal is one of the most absurd and self-defeating caricatures of modern political history. The excellent pamphlet that's published by Glenn O'Hara this morning analyzing the record of the last Labour government demonstrates this conclusively. And the Labour Party has paid, but more importantly, the country has paid a heavy price for this stupidity. It has undermined the achievements of the party in government. It's weakened the Labour Party's ability to win by depriving it of a unifying message which can reach the centre ground. And it's led to the abject refusal of the Labour leadership to lead the country out of the Brexit nightmare. What is true, however, is that if progressive centrist politics is to be revived, it requires change. Defining populism is hard. We feel we know it when we see it, though it's important not to describe everything that is popular as populist. As the recent paper of my institute shows, there are some shared characteristics. It's politics pitched as outsiders taking on the elite. It claims to be the only authentic voice of the people. It does not simply cause division, it exalts in it. And its policies are foremost designed for emotional rather than rational appeal. Opposition to it is seen not as democratic disagreement, but as treachery. Disentangling the causes of populism is tricky. In Western politics, the most obvious explanation seems the combination of stagnating incomes post-financial crisis and cultural alienation through immigration. Social media, with its attachment to hyperbole, its tendency to conspiracy theory and debate by headline, provides a platform of engagement for these messages of anger. The fragmentation of conventional media plays its part as the traditional media decide their best hope of commercial salvation lies in identifying a constituency and keeping it in a permanent echo chamber of outrage. In non-Western countries, populism seems to be an explosion of anger at the inability of the established politicians to deliver change and also at corruption. <coughs> but in all these cases around the world, the common factors are the insistence that things must change and the belief that it requires a strongly disruptive force to achieve the change. So progressive parties associated with the status quo, they fare badly. And to that extent, the leftist critique of moderate social democracy is correct. Such parties seem 
hopelessly out of tune with the sounds of the age. So you go around Europe, and it's a pretty sorry story from conventional social democrats. The French Socialist Party, having won an election and the presidency in 2012, is now almost defunct. The German SPD is at its lowest level ever. Moderate centre-left governments were put out of power in Italy, Holland, Sweden and Austria. Spain's Socialist Party is in government, but is yet to win an election. And Portugal offers a ray of satisfaction. But overall, you have to say the position is bleak. And this, in turn, has opened the door to a renaissance of the far left. This takes the form either, as with the British Labour Party, of a takeover of a mainstream party, or as with Ben Emos in Spain and Mélenchon in France, of renewed or new radical leftist movements. This is the Sanders strain of thinking in US politics. Candidates are standing in American politics as socialists, a word that I can tell you is literally anathema for any would-be USA politician 20 years ago. And there are certain common themes in this new wave of old leftism. Back in vogue is a bigger state, promises of things like university education for free, higher taxes on the wealthy, disdain for much of the business community, especially in the financial sector, a more isolationist foreign policy, combined with skepticism, if not renunciation, of traditional Western alliances. There is support for the new environmental politics, it's true, but that support can be varies across the spectrum of progressive thinking. And then there's a new devotion to the causes of what is sometimes called left identity politics. Strong support for minorities, LGBT, transgender issues, and a willingness to embrace the politics of protest in a way that's full-on and unequivocal. This all mirrors a profound change in the sociological makeup of Western society, which is throwing up new coalitions of political support. Identity politics is displacing the politics of class. So the right-wing populism proclaims that national identity is under threat, principally from immigration, but also from what it calls political correctness and the left's embrace of minority rights. Thus, there is a new right-wing coalition of lower-income people who used to vote left on economic issues and higher-income people who hate government, favor deregulation, and voted right on economic issues. This is the Trump, Brexit, Salvini coalition, Steve Bannon is the ideological guru of it, and its intellectual coherence, by the way, is not to be underestimated. On the other hand, the disposition of the electorate to entertain leftist policies is probably greater today than for decades. In insecure times, the state seems a better protector of the people. A large public sector knows it's under siege from austerity and reform. And the left's got its own version of identity politics, reflecting a modern-day belief that an individual's identity, whether around gender, sexuality, ethnicity, is the most important thing for them and defines their place in society. This leads to a left coalition of older people attached to traditional leftist positions around the state, tax and spending, government control of business and so on, and younger people who feel oppressed by society's conventional norms and power relationships. Parts of the left resemble the populist right. They too demonize opponents. They too consider themselves the true representatives of the people, waging war against the elites who are only interested in self-preservation. All of this then causes a deep fissure across progressive politics, because the moderates suffer from being moderate. They seem flabby in the face of the scale of social injustice, they're always temporizing and compromising. And the leftists then sweep them aside, and in an age where noise and clamor easily overwhelm quiet persuasion, seem much more relevant, and particularly to the youth, much more attractive. But note that in nearly all cases, the populism which wins the power to govern is from the right. There are populist parties available on the left, not least the Corbyn Labour Party, but they seldom win power. 
Greece, possibly Mexico are the only examples, and even they need heavy, heavy qualification. So when we come to analyze the correct strategy to counter the populism, we should recognize one stark reality. Virtually everywhere in the West, progressive politics is in opposition. Even the midterm elections in the US, though they yielded big Democrat advance in the House and in certain states, they didn't deliver the resounding rejection of the president, which according to the critique of Donald Trump, should have happened. This is a president subject to a more coruscating onslaught than any in living memory. Yet, if you go to the US and pose the question, could he win again in 2020, do you say he couldn't? It's not to say he will, just to point out that he could. In Britain, we have a government it's in complete disarray, making a mess of the most significant decision this country has taken since the war. Yet, the Labour Party is barely ahead in opinion polls. And its leadership's ratings actually languish well behind those of the Prime Minister, who herself faces daily speculation about her position and is highly unlikely to lead them into the next election. Of course, there is Macron, but in a sense, that's my point. He won precisely by not being from the conventional left. So, the challenge is that neither strain of traditional progressive politics the more moderate sort, or that much further to the left, looks capable at this moment of defeating the populist right. And the risk for the moderate progressive politics is that in the ensuing tug of war with the far left, it's dragged into a strategic no man's land. However, these two new coalitions don't represent everyone. There is another coalition in the making. This is of people who are socially liberal, believe in social justice, believe enterprise is an important engine of economic progress, who want a, a state which supports, nurtures, and empowers the individual with an especial concentration on the most disadvantaged. But this group, what you might call the progressive center, instinctively dislikes the identity politics of left or right, abhors the div divisive rhetoric, and reaches instead for a unifying social and economic message. Now, contemporary conventional wisdom will tell you this coalition can't prevail. But it's wrong. Right-wing populism does not offer an answer to an interdependent world, neither in its targeting of immigrants, nor in its isolationism, nor most of all in its divisiveness, which over time pulls a country apart and no country is stronger when divided in this way. But the leftist populism, as well as the obvious point that it isn't a path to winning, will ultimately lead to dissolution because though it often raises the right questions, it gives answers that have been tried and failed in the past. And it also divides and delegitimizes the opposition. Both forms of populism in the end, do not equip people to deal with the world of change, but offer the false prospectus that change can be avoided. Both, however, do have one major element of appeal. Both recognize the widespread feeling that people have lost control of their future, that it's been determined by forces they've never consented to, culturally and economically. Therefore, to win, the progressive center must build out from that core coalition to peel off voters from the other two. And its starting point has to be to deal with the anxieties fueling the populism, to recognize the anger as genuine, to acknowledge the grievances as legitimate, not to dismiss them as invalid, and to meet people halfway at least. For example, we should willingly advocate immigration control not to pander to anti-immigrant sentiment, but recognizing you don't have to be anti-immigrant to be worried if there are no effective rules controlling who is the right to be in our country. We need great restrictions on European freedom of movement in the light of our experience of it. A new electronic form of identity to restore faith in our migration system and credible mechanisms to restore Europe's borders. All these things are not inconsistent with progressive values that are actually necessary to protect them. 
Again, we should support measures of social liberalism. But if we pursue the politics of identity with intolerance towards those who are struggling with our interpretation of it, don't be surprised if they look for defenders of their views who are equally intolerant. Likewise for Europe, if Europe ignores the desire of European people to keep their own identity as nations, even as they freely cooperate for the common good, European leaders, leaders will lose support and they'll mistake such attitudes as reactionary when they express only a natural sense of belonging. In the same way, we must give answers to the legitimate questions from the left, focusing policy and resources on those left behind, and satisfying the public insistence on change corporate responsibility and governance, especially in areas like payment of taxes and treatment of the workforce. Populism thrives on the politics of fear. It's always looking for someone or something to blame. But the fear usually derives from a worry that's real. So you have to deal with it. After that, the task is to create a new policy agenda, a new narrative, which can replace the fear about the future with hope. Now, the spirit with which we approach this task is the same as it's always been. A passion for social justice, a belief that the less we act collectively, together, to provide it, inequality and inequity will persist and deepen. And these are the principles you then have to apply to a changing world. So, the really important question is, okay, if this is a changing world, what's the nature of the change? All the traditional questions of macro and microeconomics, social welfare, public services, security, all of these remain. And there's much policy work to be done in order to reshape policy in a way that produces fairness and prosperity. But I would like to suggest to you that the key to understanding this changing world is the ongoing and accelerating technological revolution. Progressive politics is missing the true significance of this revolution. It's changing everything. And the first group of politicians to master its effects and weave its changes into a vision of how economy and society should best be transformed, they will own the politics of the foreseeable future. You know, when I left office, technology was important. But it seemed, if you were in government, that it was like any other issue. Okay, you had health, you had education, law and order, defense, and then you had technology. Today, technology and the next set of changes, artificial intelligence, automation, quantum computing, they are going to be disruption for every single facet of life. For public services, there will be the opportunity to transform completely the way they work. For example, diagnosis and treatment in healthcare, or personalizing education for each child. The challenge for business today is going to be digitalization. For example, driverless vehicles will change transport, reconfigure car ownership, and of course they're going to remove jobs. And consequentially, they'll alter the whole of the car industry. Virtually any job or any business could have a digital twin doing it differently. Now, there will be huge potential benefits, but there are going to be substantial changes in the labor market, displacement of existing ways of working, and many risks because of the vast issues around misuse of data, relationships between, for example, robotics and humans, responsibility, accountability. The point, you'll be delighted to know, is not to go through all these changes. My institute has recently produced some great short primers explaining these changes and what they, they, they mean for the way we live and work. But the point is, this revolution in technology is akin to the 19th century industrial revolution. It is not simply material to politics, it's central. Many of those jobs that have been lost over the past decades from communities left behind actually were from technology, not trade or immigration. But all of this is going to intensify greatly. The danger, actually, is of a tech lash where in the absence of a proper dialogue between change makers and policy makers, we regulate badly, miss the opportunities, and fail the challenges. 
and to be noted to all Western politicians, China's advances in this area, especially AI, are going to pose an enormous challenge to us. <coughs> Their ambitions are very clearly set out. And as I always say to people about Chinese politicians' spe speeches, you might as well read them, because they actually intend to do them. Western politicians are <laughs> not always like that. <laughs> but as Chinese, if they say it, that's what they intend to do. And in a sense, good luck to them. But the point is, we can't be left in this race. And meeting the challenge is going to require a substantial redesign of the state itself, what it does, how it does it, what it taxes, how it spends. The way people live, their expectations around their lives, how they balance work and recreation, what it means to have a career, what retirement looks like. All of this is likely to change in ways we cannot accurately predict, but we can predict that it will be transformative. And the risk, therefore, is clear that some people will be qualified to handle the revolution, and some will be left stranded. This is the equity challenge for progressives. And to meet it, therefore, nations need a unifying economic and social narrative. We don't need an identity politics which divides. We can be British and European. We can come from different ethnicities or faiths but share common aspirations for our future together. Politics which polarizes which sets people against each other, which regards the other tribe as the enemy, is destructive of the unity that in fact is going to be vital to progress and success. So, to conclude, there's no doubt in my mind there is support for a revived progressive centre. There's an obvious question, can it be done when the established parties are increasingly occupied by vocal activists from the right and left who want to vacate the centre? Well, parties could be reoccupied, and this would be the simpler course. But if not, then as I've often said, the politically homeless are not lacking commitment or conviction, and they'll find a way of building a new home. But this is actually a second order question. The first is to agree what agenda and narrative can answer the appeal of populism and govern the future. The urgency of renewing progressive politics in this way, in a way that defeats populism rather than imitating it, is manifest. But, let me end optimistically. The progressive centre is not done. All over Europe, there is an energy today coming from those who refuse to have our politics defined by division and hatred. You can see it in political parties and in groupings all over Europe today in response to this populism of left and right. In the USA, candidates in Florida and Texas recently showed how opinion could be moved by a message which unifies. So populism is not yet in retreat, but I think the strategy to drive it into retreat is becoming clearer. Now the question is whether progressive politicians are brave enough to stand up to those in our own ranks who want to fight the fire of populism with our own fire and say our job is not to burn but to build. Thank you very much. detailed analytical speech. I'm going to ask uh, just a few questions and then I'll take some from the, from the audience. But uh, can I start with something um, slightly different, if I may, Tony? The um, death was announced last week of Jeremy Hayward, Lord Hayward of Whitehall, one of the great civil servants of the last 20 years. He was someone who was a great friend of King's College teaching the students. He was a great supporter of the academy, believing that the lessons of history are relevant for uh, politicians today. You also served four prime ministers, uh, including yourself. What were your memories of Jeremy, the man and the civil servant? Well, he was an out Jeremy was a, an outstanding public servant, I mean, a really good colleague. And <coughs> you know, the fact that he served four prime ministers, um, let us say, were quite different from each other. 
and did so keeping on the right side of all of them. I think his tribute to his enormous small p political skills. Um, and he was a prodigious hard worker and a very good human being, and we will miss him greatly. Thank, thank you for that. Um, now, turning to your, your, your talk there, um, in terms of your views on the Labour leadership, I mean, I think you made it clear that you uh, regretted they were not taking more of a stand against Brexit, but uh, assuming, and maybe it is an assumption, that the, the deal, inverted commas, agreed yesterday gets through the Cabinet, what is then your advice to your Labour ex-colleagues or Labour members of Parliament of how they should respond and react? I vote against it, and you know, my view is you've got to put this back to the people. I mean, the thing that's really difficult, there will be an enormous attempt which really does come from a, a, a good place, and I completely get it. Anyone with long experience of politics understands this. There will be an enormous attempt to say to people, look, for God's sake, we got a deal. Let's do the deal, get this damn thing off the table, and move on. And, you know, I completely understand the sort of psychology behind that. The problem is, this is not a deal that Parliament, if, if you said to members of Parliament, right, leave aside everything, all considerations of party, what happened in the referendum, blah, 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 blah. You guys just vote on the basis of what, if, whether you think this is a good deal for the country. You, you barely get 20 votes for it. No one really thinks this is a good deal. What's more, the people within the cabinet, if these guys who are the leavers in the cabinet today accept it, they're not accepting it on the same basis as the people who voted Remain. They're going to say, look, I tell you what, tactically, let's just go along with it, pull us the other side of March 2019, and then we can make sure in this transition we pull the thing back to a harder Brexit. So the fallacy, and this is what I'd say to any from the business community, is if you think this is going to resolve the disagreement and end the argument, it's not. It's going to perpetuate it. And then I tell you what will happen, we'll get into the transition arrangements, and you'll find that there's still no answer to the problem because the, the negotiating objectives are mutually incompatible. They, the circle can't be squared. So at a certain point, you're going to have to choose. And as I've said before, there are only two Brexits that work. There's the pointless one, which is you keep in step with Europe's rules to minimize economic damage. Okay, that's the pointless one. Can you then keep the rules, but you lose your say of them? Or there's the painful one. Okay, which is you break away from the single market customs union, but because British industry has been working on the basis they're part of these, the single market and customs union, that's going to be painful economically. There's no way out of that. So pointless versus painful. It's not a great choice. And if the third one's postponed, it doesn't look great either. So my point is vote this thing down. And if you want to reunify the country, there's only one way you're going to do it. And I know it sounds counterintuitive, but it really is true. The only way you're going to reunify the country is if Parliament says, look, we honestly can't support this deal. You, the people, are now going to have to decide what you, you want to do. Because you gave the original mandate to the government to do this Brexit negotiations. And here's the irony for Theresa May, you know. If she said, Look, I'm going to put this deal, I've spent two and a half years doing my best, it's the best I can do, and Parliament votes, if Parliament votes it down, you the people are going to have to decide. The irony is she'd probably keep a job. I mean, it's not my job to give her advice as to how to keep a job, but she actually... I'm sure she'll listen to any advice at the moment. Well, yeah. the irony, if you had the imagination to see this, the fact of the matter is, this is the... because then... Okay, you have the uncertainty up to the next vote and the, and the referendum. But in that referendum, everyone would have to accept, and I would accept from the point of view of Remainers, and I can say that having talked to other people who are staunch Remainers, they would be in the same position as me. I would have to say, this vote is conclusive. If you vote to leave in those circumstances, that's it. End of story. I mean, I regret it, but there it is. It will give you clarity. But if you go ahead with this Brexit, where even the people who are most passionate about Brexit say it isn't Brexit, you're going to leave everyone with a bad feeling. So, as I say, I understand the enormous weight of, oh, for God's sake, let's, she's done the deal, let's do it, let's put it through, but 
it's not going to resolve anything. And by the way, if you talk to any of the European officials privately, they say Britain's basically caved in. So they're also going to be saying, once you get the other side of this March 2019, they're going to be saying, you guys have agreed that you're in this customs union until we let you out. Whatever they say before then, after, because that's what they believe they've agreed. Because if the Financial Times report particularly today, that reads to me as if it's probably pretty accurate, which are these three routes. If you actually analyze them, they're all routes that, that mean that in the end Europe's got to agree. So that means they've got a veto on the situation. So you will prolong the uncertainty. You're leaving without any losing your say, losing your control that you have, and in pursuit of a deal that's a bad deal. But honestly, I, I, so my advice to the Labour Party is leave this thing. I mean, if they let it, by the way, if the Labour Party actually led the case, and I, I know some of the MPs in the strong leave seats, you know, my successor, Phil Wilson's in a strong leave seat. Phil's out there saying, look, I can't support this. You, the people, want to support it. You support it, but I can't support it. He's, you're not under some great pressure from people. They say, okay, fair enough. So your, but your vote in your, the referendum you proposed would be between accepting the deal, allegedly as it is now, or remaining in the EU, yes? Yeah, so his, I mean, I think this will require discussion as to what the right question is. Because there's a case for saying it's Theresa May's deal or remain. There's also a case in that the Boris Johnson people make this very um, strongly, and I understand it, and I think probably it's right, that actually, if you are going to reconsider this question, the one thing that really doesn't have public support is half in and half out. So you really, if you're going to go back, go back, and in a sense, it's remain versus leave, but I think there will be two big differences to the last vote, which is why it's not, it's completely wrong to say it's just a rerun of the original referendum. The two big differences are, number one, the, our knowledge of this whole process has been greatly enlarged. I mean, no one can say we don't know more about what the, well, I know more about the single market and customs union than I ever knew before, right? So, I was prime minister for 10 years, so. <laughs> I think our knowledge is greatly enlarged, and I also think, and this is the, the thing that is most important, I think. I am sure from my discussions in Europe that if Britain is going to reconsider, Europe will step forward with a different offer. Because Europe also has had its politics transformed the last two and a half years. And this is the great irony of the British vote. The British vote was a vote about Britain. But the anxieties underlying Brexit are anxieties across Europe. So this is why I also think the other dimension of this would be for Europe to say, look, okay, we'll deal with your freedom of movement problems, we'll deal with the general immigration problem, and we'll deal with the issue of recognizing that they're inevitably, those in the Eurozone are going to integrate in a different way from those out of it. Now, I think if you, if you put that all together, you, know, you would have a very credible, credible offer. And then, frankly, as I say, the British people in those circumstances vote to leave. That's it. I mean, you just got to get behind it and make it work. Okay. Final question for me. You talked at the end about building what you might call the manifesto for the progressive centre, and then you touched on the way in which the parties may or may not be able to deal with that. If the parties don't change, how would you build a new home for people who supported the progressive centre, given we have a parliamentary system, not a French system where a leader can come from outside? This is the secret journalist in you escaping, Alan. Uh, no, just a question. Uh, yeah, no, and it's a very good question, which I think I can't really answer today. Okay. Um, I mean, it's... I, you know, as a member of the Labour Party, I hope the Labour Party returns to somewhere closer to the centre. Um, the real point I wanted to make today is the most difficult thing is what's the agenda for the future? Because it doesn't matter, I mean, you can have a new party or not a new party, but in the end the question is, what's the answer to the problems that are giving rise to, to, to Brexit, which are to do with cultural anxiety on the one side and economic anxiety, stagnating incomes and so on on the other. And you've got to have an answer. 
And what I'm suggesting today, and this is something that we need to debate around politics, I actually think this technological revolution is the heart of what, you know, if you don't grasp that, you're not really grasping the changes that are happening. Now that is, when I look at the political debate today, I don't really see that as a big issue. But when I go out in the world, outside politics, that's what I see everyone talking about. So, you know, I was in Lisbon last week at this vast technology conference, you know, with like sort of 70 to 100,000 people there. And every single bit of work that you can think of, someone is trying to create a digital twin. And when you just think of how things are going to change in the next years, so that's the thing we need to decide first. You need to decide, what's the agenda? What, what is it? Because the values don't change. It's all about pursuing social justice. So what's my beef with today's Labour leadership? It's, it's not that they say we must have a more just society. I agree with you. And what's more, I also say, and the last Labour government in many ways delivered one. But my beef with them is, yeah, but you guys think you're going to create a more just society by basically having a bigger old-fashioned state, you know, okay, it's great to give everyone things for free, but in the end we all know they're going to be paid for. And, you know, would you really say in transport policy today, which again is going to be absolutely transformed by technology, by the way, in transport, that the big issue is renationalizing, bring back British Rail? You know, that's my beef with them. It's not that they got, they're posing the wrong questions, it's they're giving the wrong answers. Okay, thank you very much. Now, any questions from the audience, I'm sure. I'm not sure if you have got Logan Mike, so you have to speak up. The lady there I saw first is in the back. Speak up and say who you are. Uh, that he that we do. Good. Hello, hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Antoinette. My name is Antoinette at King's College, London. Uh, so, so, let's think about populism, uh, us and them. And think about free speech and sovereignty, these two quite strong abstract but strong values. So there's some evidence to show that online communities, online chatter, 4chan, Reddit, uh, a lot of the right-wing chatter is backed by two values, free speech and sovereignty. So my question is, is that have we missed something here as, as the progressives or as the centre? Have, have, you know, has the, the, the progressive centre or the left-wing side, whatever it is, have we missed the point that we should be talking about free speech and sovereignty uh, to win this online battle which is which is playing out. Yep. Thank you. That's a very good question. So this is what's happening, I see this very clearly in the US by the way right now, is that partly the populism of the, of the right so enrages people who are progressive that it stops them thinking straight. You, you, you get to the point where you just, you find it so repugnant, you just think, oh my God. Right. So you go into your own world and you don't deal with their arguments. So the sovereignty thing is really about where does the nation state go in a globalizing world? So we've got to have an answer to that. And what I'm saying is, you've got to have an answer that is tied to national interest. I mean, the reason that I believe that Britain should stay in Europe is because I think that protects Britain's national interest. Now, I also do feel European as well as British, but I know I have to address that argument if I'm going to win. So you can't go out of the sovereignty argument. You can't just kind of say, well, I'm not, I'm not bothering with that. And likewise with free speech, I think a lot of the right wing focus on free speech, because frankly on university campuses and elsewhere now, there's an intolerance towards people who, who, who think differently. We, we've got to be intolerant of the intolerance, I'm afraid. You, know, you can't have a situation where people can't go and speak in a, can't, you know, okay, if they're, if they're promoting, promoting Nazism or racism or something, it's a different matter. There are laws to deal with that. But someone comes along and says, look, I don't agree with the identity politics today or something, or says, you know, I want to come and speak about the state of Israel. You can't people ban, you know. So we've got to be, we've got to be prepared to reach out. You see, reaching out means listening to people and getting to a place where you can kind of unite people. And the risk in our politics today, and as I say, I see this really clearly in the US right now, 
is that the whole thing is becoming so divided and so fragmented, people literally don't want to listen to the other point of view. I mean, I find in the US it's, I mean, actually, virtually anywhere, it's impossible to have a rational conversation about Donald Trump. I mean, it's pretty impossible. Okay. I mean, there's a friend of mine, an American guy, who's he's coming up to Thanksgiving time for, for the US, and uh, I said to him, are you looking forward to Thanksgiving? He said, oh, no, not really. He said, last Thanksgiving was terrible. I said, what, what happened? He said, oh, so, um, we had this terrible argument about Donald Trump around the family dinner table. And I said, why were there some people who were Trump supporters? And he said, no, 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 everyone was against Trump. I said, so what was the row about? He said, well, the young ones felt the older ones weren't sufficiently anti-Trump. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this is, it's, you know, we, we are, we're, we're dividing in this way. And, and the task is really difficult. But it's very difficult in the world of social media, which doesn't do kind of nuance, is you've got to reach out. And this is why, you know, my view of the politics, the of the progressive center is it may take a long time to get it back in, in vogue, but you've got to do it. Good afternoon, um, Susanna Brecknell, Civil Service World. We, like the Strand Group, are in interested in the institutions of government and how they work. You have set out a strong case for a really transformation of the policy agenda from a political perspective. You've also said in the past, and I paraphrase, that institutions of government are good at many things, but change is not. Do you have thoughts on how we need to change the institutions of government to meet the challenges you have set out in the technological revolution? Yeah, uh, so again, it's a very good question. So I think you've got to really think about redesigning government. Now, you know, when I was in office, we, and there are people here who played a part in this, we did make a lot of changes in, in the way government worked. But I think if I was back in government today, I'd really be thinking in quite a fundamental way about how you govern differently. And that means, I think, bring in different skill sets into government, because I do think this technological change will be incredibly important. It will be about um, building different partnerships. You see, nowadays we think it's bad if someone's in the public service, they go out to the private sector. Actually, it's a good thing if they do that and come back in. So I would, I would think quite radically about how we design the state and, and design government. And, you know, I think um, it's, it's one of these things which, you know, it sounds quite sort of technical, but it really is going to be incredibly important. And I think a lot of what we do will then, you know, you'll have to new partnerships that evolve out of this. I mean, I think, um, you know, it's, it's interesting, some small countries have... You know, if you take a country like Estonia, okay, it's a small country, but it's actually done a lot of interesting work around redesigning government. That's easy to do because it's a small country. But I really think we have to think much more radically and imaginatively about it. And again, this is my worry with the political debate at the moment. I don't think anyone's really talking about these things. And yet, they seem to be completely fundamental to whether we succeed or fail as a country. Come to the front down there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Burr. Uh, Harry Cole from The Sun. Um, you mentioned a moment ago that privately EU officials conceded that uh, Britain had caved. You met with Michelle Barnier on the 18th of July. Was that where that conversation happened? And was your visits around European capitals this summer and your visits to, to Brussels um, part of helping Britain get a good deal? Or was a bad deal? Your, was your idea of a second referendum dependent on Brussels giving us a bad deal? Look, I'm, I know I'm responsible for many things, but I really haven't been conducting this EU negotiation, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to take responsibility for it. No, look, my position on Brexit is absolutely well known. When I go and see the EU officials, not just at that meeting, but other meetings, I mean, I'm basically, I'm asking them, what's the state of play? And, you know, they tell me, they tell other people what it is. But let's be clear, their view of the Northern Ireland arrangement is that we're in the customs union, unless there's some as yet unknown way of getting out of it. And what they've done is lock Britain into joint consent. And joint consent means both sides have got to consent, otherwise you don't have an agreement. So that's why, you know, look, it is a strange position to be in, but the Boris Johnson critique of what Theresa May is doing is correct. Now, 
her critique of what he's doing is also correct, by the way, but that's another matter for the moment. <laughs> but it is correct. And, no, look, my, my view is, I think if, if... The real question, in fact, and, you know, given where, where, where you're from, I think it's a question for everyone who's in this position. The real question for a true leader is, is this deal better than remaining? And I think, if you are a true leader, and I understand the lead case, by the way, I've always understood it, but if you believe in that, this deal is worse than staying. And that's why, in a curious way, there is this unholy alliance. Um, and the reason I say you've got the step further that the Borises of this world are going to take is they've got to understand there's no way, there's no way they're going to get their deal through Parliament. So what you're going to have to do, you're going to have to ask the people, what do you want? And it's going to have to be, is it really, given all you know, you want to leave, okay, if you want to, that's it, then we're going. The alternative is we stay. And the real question, actually, for all the people in, in, you know, in the sense of your paper's position in Boris, is if this is what we're getting, which is basically, in the name of taking back control, losing the control we had, is this really better than staying? And if you want to leave, then let's put it back and see if that's what you can get. Take a question to the other side of the room. There's one over there. Um. William Keegan, The Observer, and The Strangler. Um, Tony, uh, do you agree with your old friend, Gordon? Well, perhaps you have the same experience. Gordon pointed out the other day that there were many occasions in office where his attention was drawn by somebody called Jeremy Corbyn to conference resolution. Uh, in an interview with the Spiegel recently, uh, your successor, see it but one, seems to have uh, forgotten that. Um, do you think it could be drawn to his attention? Yeah. I mean, probably not best by me. If I'm <laughs> right. I mean, it would be, I think, you know, I don't want a politician, but it would be a mild hypocrisy if I said, look, conference resolutions was the thing that weighed on my mind when I was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, let's just look, mate. I, no, I want the exact wording before we take this decision. Yeah. Um, but no, the, the irony is not lost on me, let's say. And uh, I think it's. I mean, frankly, I think it will leave the Labour Party very bitter and divided if the Labour Party facilitates this deal, you know, by either openly or by, by stealth. And, you know, the worry I think all of us have had all the way through is that the leadership is actually privately pro-Brexit. Um, okay, they say they're not, but, you know, this deal is a bad deal. You should vote against it. Okay, I understand uh, Jeremy Corbyn wants a general election. Fair enough, you can see if that's possible, but on the assumption it isn't. Because even though the Tories are exhibiting some suicidal tendencies, let's assume they're not that suicidal. Okay, if that fails, then if the Labour Party right now got behind um, the People's Vote campaign, it would succeed. I mean, that's the reality. It would, it would actually succeed. And, it, and I, you know, I say this to someone with fair experience of fighting and winning elections, as it were. I think it would be a winning strategy. Because, of course, the country will, the country will at one level, of course, say, look, we've had the vote. You know, a lot of people say to me, look, we had the vote, we're just going to get on with it. But what people now know is it's not as simple as just getting on with it. And, you know, two and a half years they have been getting on with it. And they're in this dead end. I mean, it is a cool to say. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. And by the way, the damage it will do to Britain internationally, I mean, we will just relegate ourselves. Because people say, well, what on earth have you guys done? You know, you, <laughs> you've left the European <coughs> Union, now you're still abiding by the rules. People just say, it's, it's pointless. You've done something absolutely pointless. So I think if the Labour Party took this position strongly, it would actually see itself up in the opinion polls, not down, and it would mobilize people, and then frankly, you know, it would take the issue off the table, finally. 
Whereas this way of doing things is going to keep this issue on the table year after year after year as we battle through one transition into another transition. And by the way, all the issues on Northern Ireland are going to be all replicated in the future arrangements. Because the future arrangements question is the same thing, which is Theresa May's given all these, I think she's given commitments to business, particularly the motor car industry and aerospace. I think she's given them express commitments that she will keep them in the single market with frictionless trade. So you're back into all the same arguments again. Because <laughs> there's no way you can do that unless you agree to abide by Europe's rules. I mean, by the way, if you read the presentations, the PowerPoint presentation to checkers that, that I think has been, been published now, it's not that long. It's really worth reading. Because you go through it, and it, about halfway through, and it's brilliantly done. By the way, I take my hat off to Ollie Roberts as well. I mean, Ollie, as you and I both know, very skilled guy. And the elaborate camouflage at all the different points of this document is, you know, it's a tribute to the skill of the, of the British civil service, and I say that sincerely. But it gets to this extraordinary point in the document about sort of, I don't know, page 10 or something, where it says, um, so we will have a common rule book with the EU, which means we will keep the existing EU regulation. And then it goes on to say, because it's in the UK national interest. And you kind of go, whoa, hang on a minute. I thought the whole point was to take us out of these regulations that are contrary to the national interest. But no, we're going to keep them. It was an extraordinary thing. So, you know, it's, I can't, I can't understand how we can... <laughs> If they think rationally about it, the members of parliament, and that each one of them's got to be a leader at this moment. Each one of them's got to think of themselves as a leader. You know, not as a MP, but as an actual leader. Right? At this moment in time, do what you think is right. And I promise you won't pay a price for it. If you say to your constituents, look, I've looked at this deal, it's frankly not better than saying, I can't vote for it. It's a pointless Brexit. It's neither one thing nor the other. I think it's a bad idea. I can't vote for it, but you, if you want to go ahead, you go ahead. Why are you going to lose votes? Why are people going to be out in the street protesting that you're asking them? I don't think so. I think people will, if they put it to people in that way, I think they'll respond and say, okay, well, we're going to have to decide. And then, you know, frankly, people will have to decide. Okay. It's going to be a I'm, different campaign. I'm, I'm sorry, there are lots of hands up, but uh, I'm afraid our, our hour is up. But um, I must thank you on behalf of both the Strand Group and the British Academy for coming and speaking and speaking so frankly. Uh, it's interesting that of the four former living prime ministers, John Major speaking at the previous meeting in Strand Group um, urged the need to consider a second referendum. Gordon Brown speaking at the Institute for Government spoke about that this week. You've spoken about today and there was a fourth prime minister and I can't remember what, he, well, I can't remember what he's urging, but uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's been, um, it's very good to hear you. Um, uh, thank you ever so much for giving up the time. Thank you for the audience for coming. Apologies again, not everyone can get their questions in, but I hope you'll join me in thanking the Right Honourable Tony Blair for giving his time to us today.